Hey, Jason Rice here with Lop Hop, and what I've done is I hijacked Jim Ziegler's live program. Um, one of the things I've known about Jim Ziegler over the years is he's always given to this industry. He does great interviews. He puts a lot out. He refers a lot of companies and people, and he knows a lot of people. And he's 47 years in this industry, and I think about that, not to age him any, but I'm 47. I'll be 48 here in, in November. And so he's been doing this as long as I've been alive and he's still relevant in the industry. So I thought there'd be no better way than to interview him and give, let him give back, get back to him and let him tell his stories. You know, not so much. I don't want to get into car business best practices. I want to go through because myself as a, um, you know, started young in the industry, have a company now. You know, I got a family. I got struggles, right? I got my own mental struggles, my health struggles. I got my car, my career struggles. What got me here? How did it get me here? Is a cool story, and no better than to to find that out uh, than somebody that's been doing it for a long time and is still relevant in the industry and as long as he's been doing it. So I'm excited about doing this. I know a little bit about the background watching him over the years, so I want to plant some uh, stories out there because I think they're going to be some great ones. Um, so I'm going to ask Jim. To go ahead and join on and like i said i'm hijacking his system he's running this thing um because <laughs> it's relevant. i don't i don't do live like this i do videos and i don't know how to do interviews so this is going to be awesome <laughs> how are you doing sir i'm having the best day of my entire life i'm excited you know what you know it, it'd be great to be back together at conferences and stuff and the only time i think i physically been around you was probably hmm, i'd probably be i'd probably put it around 2001 well maybe 2000 well yeah uh 2001 range two things one digital dealer the third one i think you did a um you were a speaker but also i remember bumping into you at nada and uh of course you you had the suit and the tie and and you had a crowd around you you know you're floating through that the conference uh uh with with pizzazz and, and, a, and, a, and an entourage of people, you know, and, and, and you had all the connections. And so, shoot, it's been a long time and I wish we could get together, you know, previously because a lot's, lot's changed since then, hasn't it? Oh my gosh, I've seen so many changes in 47 years, Jason. It, 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 we're in the middle of another paradigm shift. It's changing again and I've had to re-educate, relearn. And, you know, Jackie B. Cooper was a good friend of mine. I, I consider him one of the greatest trainers that ever lived. And, you know, and he, if I learned anything, it was to, to constantly be changing, constantly be, be looking at what the new trends are. Don't, don't get stuck where you are. Yeah, and you've done that. You know, like I said, you've, you've been relevant in the industry for as long as you have. Um, you're the alpha dog, right? And, and you know, uh, you could say old dogs learn new tricks, right? They, they don't have to just, uh, and uh, so, you know, that's, that's the encouraging thing, you know, as I get older and as I try to figure out, you know, where the next 15, 20 years lines up in my career, right? Because who knows what's going to happen? EV vehicles, ride share, and all that was scary, right? You go, man, are dealers even going to be around in 15, 20 years? But uh, I, I have faith that they are. I think consumers are going to want to continue to do business with local businesses and everything like that. So, but um, yeah, definitely going to have to find a, a, another path um, a, a to just maintain that. So let's get started with the simple stuff. I want not how you got in the industry because I want some backstories. I'm, I know you're a DJ, right? And I know now, mm -hmm. the, now before, before we get in this, this super B story, I don't know if that was while you're in the car business or prior, uh, prior, prior, prior. Yeah. Prior. And so, you know, some of those stories, I've seen you with pictures that look like you're Leonard Skinner with the gun. So I know, you know, you had, <laughs> some, uh, uh, you know, you're a DJ for a while. Give us some of those stories. You know, I, I think I've heard a couple of those stories, but, uh, you know, what, what were you doing before you got in the car business? Well, when you know, before I got in the car business, I was a journeyman and I was a, a, a welder, a sheet metal mechanic, aircraft mechanic. I, I spent seven years in apprenticeships with the U.S. government. And I became a journeyman in three trades during the Vietnam era. And um, Were you in the military? No, I wasn't. It was amazing. I got drafted into the Marines, and they wouldn't allow me to go because I was a crucial defense worker as a civilian. Oh, wow. So, so that kind of protected you. The entire, well, I don't know, protected me. I was working 10 hours a day, seven days a week repairing airplanes that were shot up in Vietnam. Wow. 
Yeah, so I was a journeyman welder, journeyman uh, sheet metal mechanic, journeyman airframes mechanic. So you took care of them. Man. And then when Vietnam ended, Nixon laid everybody off. And I, I, I was already a part-time DJ. I became a full-time DJ. I bet those are wild days. Those are the best days of my life. <laughs> If it, if it, we, we were gods. I mean, it was incredible. I mean, I was as well known in the radio business as I am in the car business. And I was, I was Dr. X, the big time radio celebrity. <laughs> so you got to do probably concerts behind the scenes. You got probably VIPs. You got interviews in the studios, right? All that I, stuff. I, met, I met the gods of the day. I did not get to meet the Beatles. That was the one thing that... Because I was a DJ in the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, is this know, in Georgia or where was this at? This is in Jacksonville, Florida. W-A-P-E, the Big yeah. Eight. Okay. We had a 50,000-watt radio station. Rock, country, what? Oh, it was it was rock, the Big Eight. And it was, um. they still have W-A-P-E. It's now an FM station in Jacksonville. All right. And I was the promotions director for the radio station. I was more involved in promotions and you know the great rambling raft race the great frisbee fly and we were you know anything that involved getting a crowd to show up that was my job did you get to throw turkeys out of a helicopter like wkrp <laughs> no, we, we didn't do that but you know uh, jay thomas was was the morning drive guy he's the guy that got me into radio okay and Jay Thomas, you know, he became an actor. He was a hockey player on Cheers. He was a coach on Mr. Holland's Opus, um, the actor. He died about two years ago. I'm, I miss him. But I was all the character voices on his show. I did oh. all the, we won comedy awards with some of the character. I did, I, um, I, there was a guy named Chris Clendon. He and I alternated doing Richard Nixon. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so then back then I, I imagine hot rods and cars were you into cars and stuff back then you're telling a little well, bit of the super b story there but well the, the super b was a, a sad story i've got a picture of a super b behind me here but just 1968 i was 21 years old and the plymouth roadrunner came out 383 high performance. And I, I said, well, I'd love to have one of those. Then I heard that Dodge was coming out with, with the Dodge version in December. So I, I, I bought, I ordered the Dodge version, $3,200. Hmm. 383 high performance engine. And I took the car to Stanley Mizell in Atlanta, performance and in Jacksonville, um, performance engineering. And I gave him $1,000. On a thirty-two hundred dollar car, make that's, it like fast. Buying, that's like buying a thirty grand car, putting ten grand into it. Exactly, make it faster. Yeah, yeah. So we we had a Paxton supercharger on it. We 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 tried all sorts of things. I had two fours on it at one time, <laughs> you know. And December twenty eighth, uh, I said nineteen sixty eight, nineteen sixty nine. After I had the car a year, nineteen sixty nine, December twenty eighth. Uh, we were drag racing on a four-acre road out by the dump. And as soon as we turned tires, the dump lit up. There were like five police cars hiding out in the dump waiting for us to drag race. No, oh, no. Because the dump in Jacksonville has got a one-mile road leading into it. No intersecting roads, straight highway. That's where we drag raced. So was this like a normal every Wednesday night at seven and they eventually caught on to that or was it just built up big enough? They said, Hey, we better, we heard about this. We better. No, somebody, there, there, there was a rat and there was a rat in my crowd. We don't know who, who called, who, who, who did it, but somebody called, called the police and told them what we were doing. Oh, no. So as soon as, as soon as they turned, as soon as we turned tires, the dump lit up and, and I decided to run. <laughs> 14 miles in seven minutes <laughs> wow i mean i was doing up uh, way over 120 miles an hour in that chase and I, I outran five patrol cars and one of them actually blew up they, they always were driving chevrolet and powers with 396 engines and um one of them actually blew his engine up Wow. So, so Judge Santora at the time um, 
ordered me to dismantle the car, sell sell the car, dismantle the engine, um, and a year without a driver's license and a hefty fine. <laughs> <laughs> But now you got some stories to tell. That car would be one that you go, everybody, is that that is that that one car that you kick yourself? You know, a lot of any older folks I talked to, my, my father-in-law, he had a Ford Mach 1 back in the 70s. He's like, oh, I'd have loved to have had a, a Mach 1. All the cars I've had, all the Corvettes I've had, all the, the Corvettes. I, I had a GTO at one time, 67, um, that was, was pretty built. But. Yeah. The, the Super B was the, the car that I look back on and say that was the one. <laughs> yeah, I know over the years, um, and again, the only the, my backing, but I think, what was it? Probably it started in 97, so probably about 2000, 2001, 2002. I started writing articles for Dealer Magazine. At that time, you're a featured art because I know, so I know I'm bringing that up because I know reading those articles back in the days, I guess there was about two cars I know you knew to love was Corvettes and Escalades over those years. Corvettes and Escalades. And before that, I was driving Lincoln Town cars. Oh, yeah. I I had a contract. I had a million dollar annual contract with Ford. And I was driving Lincoln Town cars. Um, and then, then when I switched to General Motors, it was I had one XLR, which was the little Corvette looking Cadillac. My wife was driving the little small SRXs, and I had what, nine Escalades and seven Corvettes. <laughs> you know? All right, so we kind of skipped ahead a little bit there, so let's go back. So you go from DJ into car sales or what? Well, it's, it's kind of funny because as a, as, a D, as a DJ, when Jay Thomas went on to become an actor, and I was doing the character voices on his show, and I was promotions director, and I was doing an air shift, and Dr. X, the big time radio celebrity, they couldn't put me on in, in daytime hours because I was too risque. I was too. You're the hard of the days? Well, not. not that how, we, we couldn't have got away with that. Yeah. Some of the things we, we, we could get kicked off the radio for, and I, I was suspended several times. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, some of the things I said are just commonplace today, but it was different times, you know. Sure. You know, this is the Woodstock generation, and um, the early 70s, the, the late 60s, um, we did all sorts of stunts. It was a, it was a good time. I, I couldn't buy a drink or a meal in a restaurant or a bar, but, and I had long blonde hair. Yeah. Hey, you look like Leonard Skinner back there in a couple of those pictures I've seen. Well, Leonard Skinner, um, there's, a, there's a general manager in Jacksonville named Tim Peeler. He worked, I believe he works at Lusa, but they have now, Tim Peeler had the apartment right across from my apartment. We lived in a, a singles apartment complex. No no married couples were allowed. Century 21 in Jacksonville. They, they couldn't even have a place like that today. So here we had, you know, thousands of people in this complex. They had a million-dollar nightclub in the center that was just for the residents. I mean, a regular disco nightclub. I mean, planned activities. And Tim Peeler lived right across the, the hall from him. I lived in G71, he was in G72, and the Leonard Skinner boys and the 38 Special Boys used to come over and jam at the apartment. I grew up with, with all the Leonard Skinner boys and the, the 38 Special Boys. Oh, they, wow. were, they were neighborhood kids in Jacksonville. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, went to school, they went to school with us. Oh, uh, wow. I didn't know Ronnie Van Zant that well. I could say hi to him, but um, their keyboard player, Dickie Powell with, with the Skinner, mm -hmm. um, Dickie Powell, we were scouts together, and I remember, this is funny, his mother used to beat him with a hairbrush and make him take his piano lessons. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> he grows up and becomes a keyboard player for Skinner. Wow. And there was Ma Mouse the Boys and Brass was another local group that came right out of my school, and Maurice Samples and Lester Langdale and uh, Ted Vaughn, a couple of the, the guys. And, oh, a lot of musicians came out of Jacksonville, but uh, there was a, a nightclub called The Scene, S-C-N-E-N-E, like a place, The Scene. And they had a band called The Second Coming. I, I used to hang with The Second Coming in my DJ years, you know, because it was, it was the place to be, The Scene. Right. And the, the Second Coming changed their name a couple of years later to the Allman Brothers Band. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes, yeah, so 
So, so I, I've got history with Leonard Skinner, 38 Special, Allman Brothers, you, you know, all these guys. And I, I need a bit. You know, Peter Noon from Hermits Hermits was a was a friend of mine in the day, and I still see him online. Uh, you know, yeah. I knew a lot of the, a lot of the the groups of the day. What happened? Could you not sing or play an instrument, so you end up DJing? No, or? I could. I couldn't sing or play an instrument, and I. Yeah, you know, your body. Were you their bodyguard for a little bit or anything? Well, yeah. Well, I actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what the, the owner of the Holiday Inn where I used to hang out. Uh, Mr. Mr. Posen once hired me to bodyguard his son when his son was having a little difficulty. I, wow. I was bench pressing 450 pounds. And, oh, yeah, I remember that. You, you talk about yeah. bench pressing. I think you yeah. Know. Well, there's some, some videos that. online. You can still Google up me bench pressing 300 when I was 67. Wow, oh, that's awesome. You know, yeah. So, you know, I was a bar fighter and a drag racer. That was my hobbies. <laughs> and, of course, that leads out of the car business. Why wouldn't it? And somewhere in there, I got married. Yeah. And somewhere in there, I got divorced. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I went down, I went to California for a year on a motorcycle. Just completely dropped out and went, went hippie. And then I came back, still whipping out. And I walked into a car and I'd sold some Hondas previously for a friend of mine that owned a Honda dealership, you know, but I hadn't actually been on his staff. So I walked into a car dealership and said, I'd like to be a car salesman. Truth of the matter is I, I had been a sales manager at a major radio station. I, I had had a career, you know, an executive career and here. I, I just want to get a good job so I could, you know, find a respectable job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I want to sell cars so I can get a good job. And I heard they give you free cars. All, all I had at that point was a motorcycle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> out of the rain. Yeah. So that was, so, so the third month in the business, I, I made $4,500. $4,500 in, you know, 1976 <laughs> that was an incredible amount of money sure. <laughs> you know just nobody made that i didn't make that kind of money as a radio executive what kind of what's the comparable was it 1500 and you now you made 4500 or what was it well a comparable as a as a, a a general sales manager of a radio station i made thirty thousand dollars a year that was extravagantly high, high money. 2,500 bucks or something. Yeah. yeah. And, and here all of a sudden, okay. all of a sudden I'm making $4,500 in a month. And get a free car. And I got a free car. And it wasn't as glamorous as the radio business. It, you know, you know I, I couldn't get up and sing with the band at the, at the, at the, at the bars. And, yeah. You know, Jay Thomas brought Robin Williams back to Jacksonville with him one time and we rode around in the motor home together, you know, and went to the, the bar where I hung out. And, you know, so there's a lot of, lot of things that, that I did and a lot of people I met. And it was, the radio was a, a much more glamorous business than it is today. Yeah, but if you think about the foundation, I would imagine – that gave you the foundation to have connections, right? And so those, the ability to have connections and know the benefit of those connections, right? That's probably where I lack a lot. You know, I, 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 I tend to be a, you know, one person focus. I'm, I, I don't, I, you know, I don't reach out connections because I haven't had that experience. So that right there probably helped you. Like, remember when I said, you know, seeing you NADA with that entourage and having people around you, that, 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 that set the foundation, I think, you know? For you to be able to, to to do that, right? You gotta treat people right. If yeah. you if you know Zig Ziglar, and I'm no relation to Zig. I knew Zig. Um, I met Zig at the National Speakers Association conventions. So mm -hmm. I'm a CSP. I'm a certified speaking professional, which is the highest earned designation in the Speakers Association. You have to earn that. Yeah. And um, as a CSP, I, I knew a lot of the big speakers. Um, you know, still do. And um, Zig Ziglar said, if, if you help other people to get what they want, you'll have more than you ever need. And I've made a, a career out of helping people in the car business 
helping others. I, I've launched so many careers that are now on the speaking circuit in the car business. You know, at least Kephart, I feel like comes to mind, you know, yeah. people, people that I've, I've helped yeah. and with no expectation of reward. That's, that's, that's the key. Help other people and don't get caught doing it. Well, you know, I've taken that a little bit from yourself, you know, because you always push yourself out there to be the dealer advocate, right? I mean, that's why I remember all your articles where it's beating up on the OEMs and, and calling things out to protect the dealers, right? You know, and you know, that's one of the approaches that I've always tried to do on myself. It's like, you know what? The dealers are my clients. My dealers are the ones that help, you know, before when I was selling cars, obviously it was the customers that paid my bills, but the dealers are the ones able to put you know, food on my table to help, not the OEMs, right? They're not there to... Um, protect me there shoot they're hardly there to sometimes to protect the dealer sometimes you know oh, so. you know it's it's amazing if I was a crook I could be so much wealthier yeah you know yeah. I mean I've, I've been offered so much under the table over the table money just to shut up <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the, I, I got a funny story if you were here a really funny oh, story yeah, bring it on that's what this um, is about I've, I've been the keynote speaker for 98 state dealer teams you know like you know you, you take massachusetts i've been their keynote speaker five times uh texas three or four times um Mi minnesota four or five times new york four or five times you know california several times it just you know Co colorado i, I want to bring up people to especially not on the vendor end for people to understand the, the ability to have that is huge because i mean I apply to speak at events and you get turned down a lot of time just to try to be a speaker at a workshop, much less the keynote, right? So to be able to have the clout or the the know people know you that well to be able to accomplish that is huge. And I charge and I charged them. Yeah. And then you got paid I mean, for it. Just, I, I'll do it for free, you know, just I was charging I was char I was charging the dealer associations uh speaker fees. I mean, I I I don't believe in speak free speech and I'm a professional speaker and they Every day, state dealer convention I spoke at, New Jersey, New York, whatever, they paid me, plus first class travel. I don't fly in the back of no planes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know I, I, I used to put that in my ads, you know, <laughs> dog don't fly in the back of no planes. I don't even know what goes on back there. I, I looked back there one time, people <laughs> groveling for peanuts. I mean, I don't do that. <laughs> so, I think I cut you off on your funny story. So, what, what, what happened? Okay. This is October of 2001. Okay. Now, you got to remember, the World Trade Centers had just fallen. September. The nation was on high alert. Mm -hmm. And I am the keynote speaker for the Pennsylvania State Dealers Convention, the opening keynote in Atlantis in the Bahamas. Ooh. So we had to fly to the Bahamas. And, and this is a couple of days after 9-11. I mean, and you go to get to the Bahamas, they searched your suitcases by hand. It took hours because they had no electronic equipment to do that. Yeah. I mean, you got to imagine how disheveled the whole world was. Mm -hmm. So here we are, and, and my wife was with me. And Paul McMillan was the head of the, I, I don't know if he still is or not, but he was the head of the Pennsylvania Auto Dealers Association, the, the administrator. So about 10 minutes before I'm going, I said, Jim, what are you going to talk about? I said, well, shit, I don't know. I, I never prepare a speech. He said, he said, we're paying you the next amount of dollars. And you, you, I said, it's going to be good. Just trust me. I have never, ever prepared a speech. Every one of my speeches, I, I know my subject well enough. I'm talking about industry events and future things. Yeah. He said, well, Ziggler, don't do anything off the wall. Got like 300 people in the audience. Don't do anything off the wall. So who do you think you hired? <laughs> you know, don't do anything off the wall. I get up there and so help me. Ten minutes into the speech, I said, oh, and by the way, this coming Thursday, Bill Ford's going to fire Jack Nasser. <laughs> <laughs> you can hear the chairs clanging in the back of the room as the Ford dealers and executives ran out of the room. <laughs> And the McMillan's over there going, oh. <laughs> but, but I, I was right. You're talking about, you wouldn't have been able to say that, would you? It came to pass. Yeah. Wow. And, and, you know, it was, it was, it was always. And then there was a, 
I was keynote speaker for the New Jersey State Dealers Convention one time. This was when um, they were trying to bring the cherry auto. Malcolm Bricklin was trying to bring the Chinese cars this year. Sure, you remember that? Yep. I forget what year it was, 2002 or three, whatever. Yep. So, and Malcolm Bricklin was trying to introduce, you know, he, he brought you know, a number of imports into the country. He was trying to bring the cherry automobiles. I said, Chinese cars are never going to come ashore in a million, billion, trillion years. They might buy existing companies, but we're never going to have a Chinese manufacturer. And I was criticized in automotive news. I was criticized. Guess what? Here it is, 2021. We've never had a Chinese manufacturer come ashore. I was 100% right 20 years ago. But Malcolm Bricklin and I were both speaking at that convention. So I'm looking right at Malcolm Bricklin, and there was a dealer, Bob Suzuki, who was the only dealer that had bought the franchise from me. I mean, he was selling the franchise for like $250,000, and he had one dealer, Suzuki, who had bought the franchise. So Bricklin's sitting in the front second row, and he's got Suzuki sitting with him, and I said, and I just did my speech about Chinese cars are never going to come ashore. Number one, because they're a communist country. They have the biggest standing army on earth and no, no enemies. They're counterfeiters. They steal everything. And, and plus, he's Malcolm Bricklin. <laughs> and, and I said, and I see Mr. Bricklin sitting in the audience with Bob Sazuli, the only dealer that bought a franchise. Hey, Bob, I guess you must be the head of the dealer council. <laughs> <laughs> What if he got his money back or not? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, funny, funnier things have happened. Um, the first convention, I, you got me rolling now. I mean, you got me. Yeah, got so I say, I, I've heard some of these stories over the years, but it's during other people's interviews. So I'm like, you need to have a dedicated time to share. Some <laughs> the first convention I spoke at was 1987. All right, but hold on. Let's do a little bit of a. You sold cars, but you went to F and I, right? And then F and I, you got really strong in, did some record months that got you into doing training, which then doing training got you into spot speaking opportunities, right? Okay, it, it was a, a progression. It was, it was, it was absolutely amazing because what happened was when I got when I got to Atlanta, which um, is a whole additional story. I was broke. I was divorced. I was still mad. So I, I got to Atlanta. I became a salesman. I I, I became a. I never was a record-setting salesman. I was a, a, a good salesman. I I was never beaten any dealership I worked for. But I wasn't a world record-setting salesman. I wasn't an Ali Rida. You know, I wasn't. I yeah, wasn't I a month once or twice. So yeah, I mean, but I was always at the top, but not yeah. But I was never beaten by anybody on the same sales force as I was on. So. I met my wife. She was not. That mean, that mean. Laid her away. Made a, made a fortune on that deal. And uh, made all the payments. <laughs> anyway, so she she her family was a little reticent about her marrying a car salesman. So I, I told the dealer I got to be a manager. <laughs> <laughs> and I became I became an F and I manager and and it's pretty well known. I was the first F and I manager to do a thousand dollars in retail unit. I, we 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 can't document anybody doing that number before I did it. I did it in 1982. Okay. You know, so that was where I got some national recognition, and I was one of the managers at Dyer and Dyer Volvo when we broke the million dollar barrier. So I did a million dollars in one month in F and I. I was one of one of five. I wasn't the yeah. sole person that did that, but I was a participant. So I had a lot of national recognition and I kept bumping into pay cuts. Hmm. You know, I kept out distancing my pay plan. So in 1986, I came home one day and I said, they did it again. And I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to start a consulting company. My wife said, you're going to do what? I said, I've got stacks of notes, legal pads, I know exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to consult car dealers, train them. I'm going to get underperforming dealers and make them, make them. She said, who else is doing this? I said, nobody. <laughs> I, invent, I invented our business. I really invented the car consulting business. You know, how many are out there today? I, 
nobody was doing it. I was just out there. Yeah. And I heard that Jesse Jackson and the Rainbow Coalition had made a deal with Ford Motor Company to have 300 minority dealers on them. They had made a deal. They were going to have 300 African-American dealers. I jumped on a plane and made an appointment and went to Detroit and came back with a contract to consult that program. Nice. And plus, I, on top of that, I was on Ford Motor Company training videos. And then the next thing I know, the parts and service division of Ford Motor Company made me their official F&I school. And I was the, the voice of Ford ESP service contracts nationally. So I got three deals going with Ford over a million dollars total the first year in business. Can't complain there. It took me a while to get them. <laughs> no, <it's> like <laughs> <laughs> we're rocking and rolling. I got three different deals with Ford Motor Company. And it's essentially yourself, right? I mean, other than maybe, I don't know. No, if I, had, I hired 40 okay. employees the first year. Okay. Okay. We had, we had 6,000 feet of offices and 40 employees before the first year was up. Wow. I mean, we, we, <laughs> that, that all crashed in 1991 during the Gulf War. And I started over again. You know, I've crashed twice. You know, so that. Yeah. To that, you know, again, I'm on the vendor and I, I'm doing kind of the same path a little bit. You know, I'm able to do software nowadays versus two to help stretch that. But what made you uh, what what caused those crashes? Was it trying to grow too fast? Was it got you tangled up Did one of these you put too, no, much, well, too many eggs well, in one basket and it fell apart? And now all of a sudden, I mean, what happened? Well, 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 first of all, I had 40 employees and half of those employees were in the office. Half of those employees were on the street. I mean, most of them were traveling consultants. Yep. And we were working in dealerships for a percentage of profits. Okay. 1991, when the Gulf War hit, Saddam Hussein, Kuwait, uh, the economy crashed. Yeah. January 16th, 1991, I was in Oswego, New York at Burrett Chevrolet, and there was a blizzard. The Gulf War started that day, and it was my birthday, January 16th, 1991, and not a customer in sight. I mean, you know, here we are, and all the, I couldn't train the salespeople because they were glued to the TV. It was the first time a live war had ever been seen on television. The, the Gulf War was live on CNN. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, I was probably a junior high school. I remember. So I wasn't impacted financially, you know, my career, but that's because I was in college. So I didn't know that element of how impact on the economy. Right. You know, well, it was the car business crashed hard. Oh, no, I was high school, high school, junior high school. And, yeah. and at the end of that year, my, my accountant said, Jim, we're in financial trouble. I said, you know, we got $5,000 in the bank. And he said, I haven't taken any of the withholdings out of our employees' paychecks and mm -hmm. submitted it to the government. We took it out, but we didn't submit it. Yeah. So right yeah. now, I'm, I'm owing about a quarter of a million dollars to the IRS, another quarter of a million dollars to American Express. Every one of my employees had an American Express card in their pocket. Mm -hmm. And we got $5,000 real money in the bank. So I laid off all my employees negotiated out of the lease and one employee stayed with me, Al Adderhold, um, senior older guy. He said, I'll stay with you and I won't take any, any pay. And in December, we started making a hundred phone calls a day, Jason. Mm -hmm. Eight o'clock in the morning, I'm talking to dealers on the East Coast. Eight o'clock at night, I'm talking to dealers in Hawaii. We're calling right across the time zones. Yeah. And we raised, I'm, what, I'm trying to remember the number, January of, of 1992, I believe we raised $40,000 coming off of a $5,000 bank account. Hmm. You're coming off of a nearly a million dollar real loss in 91. Yeah. We, and then I made a deal with the IRS. I made a deal with American Express. We did not declare bankruptcy. And that's where I came up with the thing. There's no problem on earth you can't sell your way out of. Sure. 
And that's, yeah. that's what I love about the car business. I mean, you, you, I mean yeah. so many people in the car business figure a way out. We'll figure it out. My wife hates hearing that from me. What are we going to do? Well, well, my wife, God bless her. I mean, I woke up in the middle of the night. My heart was palpitating. I was I was having panic oh. attacks. And she said, we're going to get out of this. We're not going to declare bankruptcy. I said, you got that right. Mm -hmm. Within 14 months, we were totally debt free with perfect credit. We didn't default on anybody. We paid all of our bills. We sold our way out of it. You know. When I owed a quarter of a million dollars to the IRS, I thought they were going to drag me to the basement of the federal building and put me in handcuffs. But they, 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 they let me work out of it. Yeah, you and, know, I, I had a similar experience. You know, uh, I guess it was probably 08, 09 when the recession hit, but I was making a ton of money. But the more you made, the more you spent, right? And so we got sloppy. We paid cash for trips and everything. And next thing you know, we're behind on our bills. And I, I'm literally, I think, two months behind on my more. I'm waiting for it. <laughs> You know, and I told my wife, so I was working for a company at the time, but I had vacation time. I said, babe, here, here's what I do. And I ended up on my vacation time, took consulting jobs, you know, and like I said, it was like 10, 15 grand I had to come up with over a month or two, but I just grinded out. So it took week, two weeks vacation, start hitting dealerships on consulting on the side while I was working for that company, because again, it was my vacation time and, you know, and, and just figured out a way to get out of it, you know? And, and like I said, that's what I love about the car business because, I mean, think about all this stuff right now with COVID and, and dealers figuring oh, that out. Oh, And yeah, the recession and figuring that out, you know. In, in, in 2008, the second time the economy crashed, you know, I, I had to lay off all my employees again, close the offices again. And I was doing seminars with four and five people. And I had been doing seminars with 100 people. Wow. But you know what? I, I treated four and five people in a seminar. They're paying, they're paying $1,500 each to attend my seminars. I got five people. I don't have any offices. We moved the business back home. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's me and the wife and one computer programmer in 2008. We're starting over again, again, and we sold our way out of it. I, but I wasn't deeply in debt in 2008 yeah. like I was in 91. 91, we're still a relatively new company. You know, because I started the company in 86. So we were relatively new. I didn't have a lot of cash back up. And the economy crashed again in 2008. I just shut it down. Mm. You know, we had a paid off house, you know, 10,000 square foot home. You know, we, we were pretty affluent by 2008. So I wasn't, I, I, I lost nearly a million dollars in 2008, but I wasn't broke by a long shot. Yeah. And that's and, a blessing. And like I said, that's the that's the stories that, you know, I, I like hearing about because uh, two things. Yeah, it's a, it's uh, it's bad. It's a struggle. It's it's bad that people had to go through it. But I wouldn't change anything. Right. You know, again, you know, it was bad on my end when I went through it because other people were going through bankruptcies and losing their houses. Oh, yeah. Then they didn't have a choice. I had a choice. I was actually making good money. I was just being stupid with it. Right. And so I had to. <laughs> We ended up going debt free. We paid off, you know, other than our house, we, we got out of that problem and stuff. But, it, but you know, again, I wouldn't change anything. What you go? Well, why would you do that again? Well, no, but I wouldn't change anything. And and all people see, like over the years with yourself, forty seven years, all they see is the, the success, right? Because a lot of these stories don't get shared out of pride, ego, or whatever. But those are the reality. Everybody goes through them. Right. And, and, you know, my wife sometimes gets mad at me because I'll share too much. I'm like, well, what? You don't think these people, I mean, they don't have the same problems, but okay. They just don't want to talk about it. And, well, you know, it's, it's amazing. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm walking around with a hundred thousand dollars on my left hand. You know, you know, if you look at my left hand, you know, I've got some, some heavy duty hardware and I count in the right hand. Yeah. And my wife is identical. I mean, you know, yeah, I show off a bit. <laughs> you know, all the Escalades and the Corvettes. Um, I don't need to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm driving a pretty conservative Audi right now. You know, got the Audi Q7 and my wife's driving a Ford Explorer. I mean, we're, we're still millionaires, but we don't have to show it off anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. That's the beauty of getting older. You know, that's some of those times you just don't end up, you know, 
you eventually learn that, you know, and I was out, the younger I was, the more I wanted to try to show off things. And then the older I get and the more money I made, the less I want to show it off. You know what I'm saying? That's, it, it's weird how that works out, but yeah. Well, you know, I stopped speaking at NADA conventions in 2016, I guess it was. Yeah. And I told them I wasn't going to speak anymore at an NADA convention. They, they were shocked because nobody ever fires them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and, and the woman that was the head of the program said, well, don't you need the recognition? I said, everybody knows me. <laughs> I, mean, I, don't need any, I don't need to speak at your convention to have credibility because you, you, you sell my material, you run me ragged, and you, you don't pay me to speak. I mean, come on. <laughs> so let's talk about that transition. So I know you. I, I know you focused on F and I training, right? And then you transitioned to both sales and F and I. And well, and sales like, management. Yeah. Sales management and F and I. But well, right. you started out first by memory with F and I, right? Was I started that, out with F and I, although I held all the positions. F and I was where I set the records. Okay. So you know, I was well known in F, more well known in F and I than as a as a general sales manager. I never was a general manager. Okay. You know. And I, and I, I, I disclaim that, you know, but I was over a number of stores and in 1986, I, I was, I was manager of Cadillac dealership, um, uh, Nissan dealership in 86, um, Stovall Nissan. I was F and I director for that dealership. We were doing incredible numbers. Michael, Michael Reese, the trainer was the sales manager. I was the F and I director. We, we were knocking it out of the ballpark, you know, so. We we had the track record, you know, and I see so many people today that only credentials they have are, are Facebook credentials. Yeah. <laughs> you know, social media credentials. Yeah. And that, you know, and for for 35 years I worked in dealerships. I desk deals, I took TOs, I you know, I, I stayed relevant. I st I still I'll go in any dealership and work a deal. It's not a not a problem. But yeah, I might not know your CRM. I might have to have somebody drive it for me, but yeah. you know, I, I still like to, you know, it's all about interacting with the customers, whether you've got a technology interaction or whether you have a, and, and you know, people are saying the road to the sales, now the road to the sales is not dead, we just put technology into it. Mm -hmm. And the showroom is is the website. That's it. They always say there, there's nothing new. You know, it's funny, yeah. I, years ago when I first started doing this, I started thinking of how to market marketing use when it comes to used car management it's like okay, you become a marketing manager now before you, you better be better at marketing than desking deals right now because customers marketing, are marketing and setting appointments is more important than the actual selling skills so you'll find this funny then because then uh you know I, so i start digging in through marketing and i realized i go there's no used car manager i've ever met that got a degree in marketing they don't understand yeah. it so i i go okay i bet there's old strategies that nobody uses anymore because they think they're outdated so i went and bought uh, a, and I don't know where it is, but a, uh, uh, selling yellow pages for dummies. Cause I'm thinking, okay, think yeah. about the yellow pages is no different than Google right now. Why did the locksmith call it triple a, you know, locksmith it's so it's AAA. It's the beginning of searches when somebody goes, looks for his locksmith, right? You just, <laughs> you just SEO yourself, you just SEO yourself to the top of the list and those strategies, right. Are no different than your Google analytics strategies. It's just a different platform. And to your point, you know, yeah, you can you you can't go in there and work the CRM. It's a different platform. The strategies are the same. It's just you, you got to be able to talk to the community, figure out what the customer wants and needs are, and fulfill them. And it's that's no different. Now, how do you, how you plug it in your CRM, or or if you're doing it on a tablet with the customer, it's the same stuff though, right? Look at prospecting. My my whole thing was prospecting. I I will take any any challenger step in the ring go for the title. I am the world champion prospector. I can walk out of any dealership in the world and before the sun sets, I'll come back with a customer that will take delivery. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I teach prospecting and people don't, don't get it. No, oh, yeah. They yeah don't I, get I, when I was an internet director, I had an internet managers and, and part of prospect is just communicating with them. And I tell them here, type this in an email, say this. I go, they send it. I said, watch, they'll email you back in about two minutes. They're probably going to say this. Boom. There it comes. All right. Now type this back to them. And then, and that's a little bit of prospect. You know, like I said, you just, you're yeah. just back and forth. And, and, and it, 
it's no different than if I was on the phone, right? I would say this, I figured they'd say this, and I'd do that, right? Before even email was around. So yeah, it's just a different platform. And then you can go back to the yellow pages. You can have your one-liner, or you can go buy a quarter page ad, or a half page ad, or a full page ad. You can step up on SEM and, and put an ad at the top. I mean, it's it's the same stuff. Just it's the same stuff. When, when I was advertising, let's go back to the 80s, when, when we classified ads in the paper. People would run three inch classifiers. Yeah. PW, pay PLs, power windows. I power would run I would run fifty half inch liner ads. Double reverse, black with white ink. All it was was the dealership name and phone number. No car. All these little half inch ads look like the bottom of the ad on top of it. People would call that number. <laughs> <laughs> And that's just like buying the dealers uh, searching yeah. marketing name, saying, I'll go buy his name and pay for it. And when they search for it, they end up on my website, right? I mean, exactly. exactly. It's, it's, so as much as the industry's changed, it stays the same with some of that stuff, right? And like that's I said, amazing. And, then, and that's where you transition, right? And I think I shared this last time you interviewed me two times ago. Like I got mad when you became the keynote speaker at Digital Dealer because I've been running, I was part of Digital Dealer off the very foundation. Um, again, you know, Mike Roscoe and that team there. And um, I, I, I was part of the board of directors to get Digital Dealer off the ground. And then I think two or three years into it, he had you as a keynote. And I'm like, Ziegler, he he cried. He he used to bash the internet years ago, and and now he's up here. But you go because again, I used to read your articles, and there was you, I think you, at one point in time, man, I tried to dig it up because I hold on a bunch of articles where you said about it maybe being a little bit of a fad and stuff. But then years later, again, you transition yourself because you understood that's where the industry was going, right? And that's the cool thing that I liked about what what you've done over the years. Again, you became relevant, right? It's not well, like you know, I had income producing websites in nineteen. 1998. Okay. You know, people, people, people perceive them bashing the internet. I was, just, I was bashing a lot of the people in the internet more than I was bashing the internet itself. Yeah, yeah. And you know, it, it was, it was a fun, a fun thing. Digital dealer. Um, my, my, have you, have you seen what Mike Roscoe does today? So it's on a beach, you mean? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, he does. He does a reggae uh, band. He's a reggae. He got a reggae yeah. band. Papa Papa Roscoe R O S K O, yeah, yeah. and he's got a, he's got a he's a reggae singer. I'm going what? <laughs> I love it. Totally. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I know back then you had Emerson Autos, you had Stone Age, you had all these different companies out there just trying to grab a little bit of that business. And because um, I started doing internet sales in 98, 98 and 99. And then, you know, 2000, I started doing articles and things like that. And that's where I, and digital dealers start being involved with that by 2005, I guess, was when we did our first one. But yeah. And so your transition and staying relevant, you know, was a good move, right? You know, um, well, every, you know and, and I'm transitioning now to digital retail. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm struggling with it because I really don't like it, but I know it's what's coming and let's, let's be good at it. You don't have to like it. You see, the, the Internet's the worst thing ever happened to our business. The worst. I'll tell you why. Because we would sell equally as many cars if there were no internet, as we sell with the internet, all it's done is inserted a bunch of vendors between dealers and customers that take a ma major portion of the profit. So the internet, but now, okay, it's here. You got to be better at it than everybody else. You've got You've got out. You know, all yeah. the internet did was redistribute who gets the deals. Well, the one thing I, I would say, because I, I did, like I said, I started doing it in 98 before it was popular. We had a dealership that was, you know, aggressive in it. Mm -hmm. What I did like about it, because I didn't like being out in the point. I didn't want to be out there waiting for somebody to pull up and walk out there and grab their door. Right. I got to beat this guy to him. And we're both fast footing to him. And I got oh, well, it's my up. Right. And I so I sat inside waiting on the phone. They'd yell at me. Get out on the point. I'm like, I'm, I'm popping phones. And so that led me to do Internet because that's a phone job. But what I liked about it, they were educated. I didn't have to sit there and, you know, try to, edu re you know, it, yeah, sometimes it's a headache. And especially back then, they had their little vanilla folders with all the big <laughs> stuff in there, like Subaru buyers are, you know, and they're like, oh, yeah. and they're they're nitpicking it. But I, at least I knew I had an educated buyer and they are interested, right? They're just not kicking tires. They weren't driving by and seeing a nice truck and wanting to look at it. 
they they spent all this time and energy. I just had to fulfill their needs, right, and, and confirm what their research was. was. And it's, that was it's it. always so been me. fun, Jason. It's always been fun. Yeah. And people don't get fun. They get so serious about what we do. I got I got a story I got to tell you. Let's go. It's one of the way back stories. All right. Okay. I started to tell you earlier in, okay. in 1987, first NADA convention I spoke at, I was working with the Ford minority dealers. So one of the, one of the, the black African-American dealers, one, a friend of mine, um, oh golly, um, <laughs> oh God, Delmont Dappermont. Del Dappermont comes up to me and says, hey, that's a cool name. And he's from New Orleans. And I was working with all the all the minority dealers, you know. I mean, you, you know, so uh, Ford Motor Company was putting all the minority dealerships in little Mayberry towns. You know, do you remember the black actor in the Mayberry series on TV? Man, I'm trying to think of his character. There wasn't one. Because <laughs> <laughs> I remember most of the characters. Ford Motor Company didn't know that. They put all the dealers in Mayberry. So, so you know, I, I, I took it. But there was a guest person, but maybe not a. Yeah. Well, I don't know about it. I don't think there were. They might not even been a guest yet. I don't think there's any African Americans in Mayberry. Well, my so, my daughter and I are watching Little House on the Prairie now. We'll watch that. <laughs> we'll get that sometimes. So, so, so Ford Motor Company didn't know that all the minority dealers were going to Mayberry towns, you know, little little tiny towns, and and the, these guys and these women had their their savings. Their, it wasn't a charity program. They had their life savings in this. I took it serious. I was there to help. Yeah. You know, and anything I could do to help. And um, a lot of the dealers became very successful. So. Delmont Dappermont comes up to me at at the 87 convention in San Francisco. I said, well, you got to sponsor the African-American dealers convention. I said, the what? He said, we have a convention one day before the regular convention. Hmm. And we need sponsors. I said, well, how much is a sponsorship? He said, $7,000. I was brand new in business. I said, seven, seven grand. Okay. What do I get for that? He said, you get a table right up front near the stage. And you have you know, eight seats and you can invite people and me, me included. I said, oh, okay, you and your wife and, you know, five other couples, you know, we'll, we'll get it worked out. So here we are. My wife's wearing a mink coat. I'm wearing a tuxedo. There's maybe 200 people in the room and we're probably one of five or six Caucasians in the whole room. <laughs> you know, and all my friends are sitting around, dealers I'm working with, and the Secret Service comes up and says, we want to put a Secret Service agent at your table. Because Jesse Jackson was running for president that year, and he was the speaker. And Jesse Jackson was less than 10 feet away from me. We had the front table. Wow. So... Did I mention we're maybe five Caucasian people in the room? Yeah, that's, very, that's a very important thing to yeah. mention. Okay, so here we are. We're at the, at the African American Dealers Convention, that, uh, which eventually became NAMAD. So here we are. We're sitting there, and I had a sneeze. It was one of those sneezes where you, you do it real fast. Woman pulled a machine gun on me. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse Jackson speaking, you know, oh, and this, yeah. white, this white guy makes a fast move. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't reach for your handkerchief, you would have been trapped. <laughs> she had it under, she was talking through a little microphone in the bottom of her wristband, you know, and she said they're talking in the wristband and all of a sudden she's like that. And I, I made a quick movement and, you know, <laughs> oh, wow. my wife was going, oh no. <laughs> Wow. You know, those are good stories, you know, the fact that you've been able to support those dealers and help them get off the ground. I mean, again, I think about that a lot. You can go to school in restaurants, you know, like there might be one or two black people in there and there's 
prime partner and white. And, and then you go vice versa. If you're the one or two white person and primary black, you go, okay, now I understand how they feel when they come into the place, right? Because most of the time, I they're, imagine probably, that. they're probably the only one or two black people and 200 other dealers are sitting there, right? You know? So <laughs> they feel a little intimidated at that. They feel that intimidation, right? Oh, I was very comfortable in that. I was very comfortable in that convention until then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Matt. So then let's go down a path. Let's go and then we'll wrap it up a little bit. I want to talk about current events. Obviously, you know, your health and, and how that thing's going, what happened, what got you there. Is there anything, again, I like to try to learn from the people that's been through things before. Um, um, I bring up, well, here, um, you know, so it was a cancer, right? And and yeah. it was, um, was it a long? October, October 2019. So, the, to, did the doctors draw where it came from or anything? Or was it something yeah. you asked you go, you know what, if I didn't do the cigars or if I didn't do the cognac or if I didn't do this or didn't do that, if I can go back, I could change that. That might not have happened or anything like that. I mean, what what, what happened? Basically. Okay, well, first of all, we did we were doing the Internet Battle Plan conferences. Yep. That one those, were, those were raking in incredible money. I mean, I'm – we, we were cashing in three times a year, 250, 200 attendees, 20 sponsors, 20 speakers. It was, it was, it was a big business. And all of a sudden we did the last one in September of 2019. And October 5th, I was diagnosed as having esophageal cancer. Okay. So hold on there. Is there, and this is why I always get curious with people um, stuff. It's like, what, got you to the doctor to get that diagnosis was there cost or is there i was having wrong? trouble swallowing I was, I was having trouble swallowing okay i, I swallowed food and it was getting stuck in my throat and i was coughing it back up you know unless i really chewed the food extravagantly and did i don't want to chew forever the food wouldn't go down before it got to that point for months or years in ahead, did you always get sore throats? Where is there a little sign that you go, man, if I would have paid attention, gosh, that's what was There's happening. one thing you need to pay attention to, acid reflux. Okay. If you have acid reflux where you, you know, when you're sleeping and, and food comes back up in your throat and it burns, that's what caused it. Did you have that for years or for a few yeah, months? Yeah, I did. I, I had acid reflux um, generally when I was drinking alcohol. Okay. You know, and I, I wasn't drinking that excessively. Just um, for a while there, I was drinking something every day. Because when you get to be a, a national speaker and travel as much as I am, you know, dealers are taking you to nice restaurants. And dealers are whining and dining. You, you, you're eating gourmet food. That you get a little, you know, please give me, a, give me a Big Mac, you know. <laughs> yeah. So I had acid reflux. and. The, the, the doctor said, we need to do an upper GI on you. I think you've got cancer. So they did a an upper GI. He said, you got esophageal cancer. And um, then I had 29 radiation treatments and uh, what's six or seven chemos. And then uh, February 27th of 2020, they did the operation. And they took out two thirds of my esophagus. They took out a couple feet of my intestine on the other end, pulled my stomach up and reattached it behind my right lung. So my stomach is now a tube, it's no longer a sac. So I can't eat the big portions I was eating. And I lost 85 pounds of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, this is a large shirt and I was wearing double X's. And this, I, I, I'm, I'm loose in this one. Yeah. You know, so I lost 85 pounds. Uh, my scan two weeks ago said I'm still cancer free. That doesn't mean I, I don't have cancer. It means if I do have cancer, it's too microscopic to measure. Mm 